Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hi, David. Hi, Rhonda. Today's podcast is going to be called Mindfulness Part 2, Muscle or Myth. In the first podcast, we were promoting mindfulness as, as a muscle you can build that can help with gaining inner peace and help to combat negative thoughts. Uh, and in this one, we're going to follow up with a couple of emails from people and, and uh, some uh, stir up a little controversy, as well as pick up a few loose ends from the, uh, from the first podcast. So we're going to go ahead and, and dive in. And by the way, when, when you folks provide really awesome feedback, like the two emails that, that we have here, we really, really appreciate that because that can stimulate further podcasts and, and find out what, how you folks are thinking and kind of what, what the issues are. Um, and then I think you said you got some fo- uh, feedback, too, about the first uh, podcast, which was uh, a little on the negative side. I did. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear about that, too. Okay. So uh, why don't we dive in with, with these emails? Okay. And then we can... Um, Do you want me to read the first one? Y- yes. Do you want to read the first uh, yeah, one? this is from a, a younger colleague, Jeremy... Uh, Caramel, who uh, was a Stanford student and now is a uh, brilliant uh, software guy in in San Francisco, and he's been a friend and also a a fan, as it turns out, of, of the podcast. And he he sent me this uh, this very very thoughtful e- email. I thought our our listeners would be would be interested in. Okay, hi, David. I listened to the Feeling Good podcast on meditation this morning and had some thoughts I wanted to share. For context, I've been meditating daily for about three months. First, I personally think that if someone is struggling with depression or anxiety, Team CBT is a dramatically faster acting and more powerful tool than mindfulness. I've never seen or heard about someone having a dramatic recovery in just a few hours due to mindfulness. I've never seen the idea of resistance explored in any kind of mindfulness book or article. I also don't really think much of mindfulness as a quote-unquote method in the team model because compared to the other methods for removing negative thoughts, it's extremely weak. I imagine that with hundreds of hours of mindfulness practice, you might reach a point where it's easier to let go of negative thoughts. There are a lot of reports like that. However, it's a very slow way of dealing with negative thoughts compared to externalization of voices, etc. I think for a therapist who knows team, to suggest mindfulness as a key practice to their patient is almost negligent, since team is so much more effective. That said, I've sensed a few benefits of mindfulness, which is why I've been investing my time in it. First, I think you can view meditation as concentration practice and I've found that meditation increases my ability to concentrate. Second, you can reach a very calm and relaxed state in meditation where you cease to have thoughts, and this state is extremely pleasurable. Third, I've noticed that mindfulness increases my ability to enjoy experiences, including experiences I might enjoy less if I was having even positive or neutral thoughts. As an example, about 30 minutes of meditation the other day, after about 30 minutes of meditation, I went for a walk in the woods and stopped for about 10 minutes to look at a ridge. My visual experience was completely immersive and I even started to feel like the trees were breathing with me. It was one of the high points of my week. I suspect that even someone who had no negative thoughts might be flooded with positive but irrelevant thoughts like a yummy meal they might be headed to eat later, would enjoy this scene much less. I've also run an experiment using the paradoxical agenda setting 
and cognitive behavioral therapy to remove the motivation to have distracting thoughts. That is, write down the advantages to having distracting thoughts and disadvantages of focusing on the breath, and then talk back to those. I would classify it as a highly successful experiment after talking back to all the good reasons to think about something besides my breath, my focus got dramatically better. I wonder if this technique could be used to either improve meditation or even simply, or even supplant the need for it. Basically, it gets rid of distracting thoughts directly, while meditation is basically practice for having fewer distracting thoughts. Anyway, just thought I would share some thoughts and ideas with you. Best, Jeremy. So before we go on to the email from Paul, uh, let's let's dialogue on on what he was saying. I I loved your email, Jeremy. If you're listening, I thought it was very thoughtful, and and I thought that there was an awful lot to to agree with. I think meditation can be a wonderful thing for for people. When I was at uh, Penn doing my residency, we had this very famous professor in psychiatry, uh, Mickey Stunkert. And he's one of the world's top experts on eating disorders. And he was this very elegant, super brilliant, world famous person. Uh, and he meditated uh, a lot. And, uh, and then he went and he was the department chairman at Stanford for a while. And he created a kind of meditation garden there for, for people. And, and he was just, just a fantastic person, and he seemed to have have a lot of a lot of peace. And uh, I, I've always had a lot of admiration for for people who who meditate. But I just loved what Jeremy said. It, it's really not a very good treatment for helping people overcome depression or anxiety or or, or deal with uh, with with negative thoughts. And uh, I and I, I would almost like Jeremy was saying, be kind of annoyed uh, if, if patients were using meditation for, for their for their homework in in psychotherapy, because the homework I assign to people is very specific and aimed at getting, as Jeremy says, super high speed changes. I, I showed a video I was telling you about in the Tuesday group of a woman I treated in Canada with post traumatic stress disorder who had been having flashbacks after her husband nearly died right right in front of her and she was terrified that he might 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 still die. And and we the session took about an hour and a half and she went from just severe, severe anxiety a hundred on the zero to a hundred scale to to zero and she was more than totally recovered i mean she was just laughing and euphoric at the end of the session after having been sobbing and and terrified and that was from very specific kind of techniques aimed at her her specific negative thoughts and that would be a case where i would would not want to see her being assigned meditation as a treatment because I mean, she was cured in an hour and a half, and then for, for the next three years, she, she's still kind, kind of on a high. But uh, I, I wouldn't like to be seeing people using up their time, you know, me- meditating, be, because she, she could have meditated, you know, forever without really get, getting over her, her, her fears. Well, one, other thing I, one thing that I think is confusing is the idea of meditation as a method. And I don't think meditation is meant to cure or help people resolve psychological issues. I and, love what you're saying. Oh, thank you. And I think, you know, people have been meditating for thousands and thousands of years. And there's high, you know, lamas and, and yeah. teachers who, who've brought meditation to the United States. I think it's more of a way of teaching people to relax. And again, I'm not an expert. And to create more of a space between their thought in their action or their thought and their feeling. It's not a sus- substitution for therapy. Yeah, exactly. I, right. I, I totally agree. It's a beautiful thing. There's a lot of things that people can do that they love doing. As right. Some people are into prayer. I, I'm not into prayer, but people all over the world, I think the Muslims pray six, six times a day or something like that. I'm not an expert in it. And many people find great 
peace and in prayer, but I wouldn't uh, prescribe prayer as, as a treatment for depression or anxiety or, or anything. In fact, you might remember the Karen video. She'd been praying for nine years because of the, the grief and the anxiety she had after a horrible traumatic event where her daughter was shot in the face and she was she was blaming her, her herself and and she's a deeply religious person, wonderful person, but she said the prayer just just didn't help her, but a single session of team she went from more than full recovery again she went into a a kind of a euphoric euphoric state and so my only objection i think jeremy's objection is there's kind of a big fad now where everyone is saying oh you know mindfulness is going to enhance cbt and this is i mean act therapy and and a lot of therapies are pushing mindfulness meditation on people as if this is somehow going to accelerate their their, their recovery but this is kind of the controversy that people spoke to me about after the podcast is that they were kind of confused about what it appeared to be your hostility toward meditation. And there are sometimes meditation can be um, an adjunct to treatment and can create relaxation and help people, especially with anxiety, feel calmer. And, and you know, perhaps after a good CBT treatment uh, or session, you know, meditating and thinking about it and remembering what worked and just having a calm place. Um, I know, you know, and not an an expert on it. The Dalai Lama talks about meditation and patience be, and being an antidote to anger, and um, meditation can help people manage their impulses. And one of the things Jeremy said in here is that you can reach a um, a calm and relaxed state, which is really helpful for people. Um, he also said where you cease to have thoughts, and that's where I kind of wonder if that's true. I, I know when I meditate, I never cease to have thoughts. I just notice them, and I'm better at letting them go. Yeah. Well, I, I think if people want to meditate, and it, it can be a wonderful thing. I think where, where I get frustrated, and, and you're right, a, a bit angry, is when people are recommending this as a, as a treatment for, for, for people. And I, and I just think that the field is filled with people looking for fads or simple solutions, one thing you can do to, to treat everything. And, and it just, it just it, to me, it's, it's one of the worst tendencies among in, in psychotherapy people are like oh and I, to me it's just the latest fad t t type of thing and I, I can give an example uh, of, of why I don't like it as a prescription for, for people for, for, for treatment uh, I, I treated a, a man uh, who had escaped from Nazi Germany as a young man and he went to got to New York City. He was a teenager, and he started out shining shoes, and worked and worked and worked, and became a wealthy industrialist and and had manufacturing uh, plants right right in Manhattan. And he w he came to me in his seventies because he'd had a lifelong depression, and he'd been to you know four or five or six psychiatrists. No one had been able to help him, and and the thought that upset him was that he was a, a worthless human being. And at the time, the fad was not meditation, but exercise, and this myth about exercise in, increases brain endorphins, which is not true, by the way. It's just something that somebody made up. You can't actually measure human brain endorphins. It's just, oh. it's just some more BS that somebody came up really? with. Really? Isn't that... Isn't it... Isn't there research that shows that when people exercise vigorously exercise, it reduces the level of depression they're feeling? Well, that's another issue. It has a placebo effect, but nothing greater than a placebo effect. But at any rate, I decided to to go along with the fad, and I, I told this fellow that you know he 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 needed to boost his brain endorphins. And I pushed him to start running, and I got him running farther and farther. So I got him to where he was running 12 miles a day. And then I said, Ezekiel, how, how did you feel at the beginning of the 12-mile run? And he said, I felt like a worthless human being. And I said, how did you feel at the end of the 12-mile run? He said, I felt like a totally exhausted, worthless human being. <laughs> right. It absolutely did nothing to help him with his, with his, with his uh, worthlessness. You, you see, people have specific negative thoughts, specific issues that require specific solutions. He, he could have meditated for a hundred years 
and his anxiety and his depression would not have improved even one part in a hundred. He would not have found inner peace. He would not have found joy. Finally, I pushed him to say, you know, Ezekiel, why, why, why do you feel like you're a worthless human being? What, what, what is it? What, what is the issue? Uh, let's get specific. And then he, he, I really had to push him because he didn't want to admit it. And then he admitted and started sobbing that ever since he'd been a little boy, he'd have the, he'd had claustroph- claustrophobia and the fear of the dark. And so he felt that this mean, meant he was unmanly and that, that he was worthless. And he had hidden this from every psychiatrist, from, from, from every person. And you can see now that he, he could be meditating forever. And it would in no way help him get, get over the, the, this problem. Now, as, as you know so well, we, we've got now over a hundred specific techniques we can use to, to help people with different kind of negative thoughts. And so I, I told him what I want him to do is to get up at two in the morning set his alarm clock, and then go down into the basement of his house, would be super dark, and roll himself up in a carpet so he'd be trapped, you know, with his arms for claustrophobia. Wow. And then put a tape recorder there going so he could dictate every minute or two how anxious he was. Yeah, it makes me nervous just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and what his uh, negative thoughts and fantasies were. Wow. Well, he fired me. I, don't, I can understand and why. <laughs> he, he thought this was the most irresponsible thing. Mm-hmm. And that's, of course, people with anxiety run away from their fears. Right. And he uh, went to a, uh, got a consultation from a psychiatrist in New York to find out what's wrong with Dr. David Burns giving out this irresponsible advice. And fortunately, and I don't know who it was, but I say, God bless the guy. He says, Ezekiel, Dr. Burns is exactly right. You need to go back and keep working with him and do exactly what he he told you to do. That's the only way to defeat these fears. So he came back to me and he agreed to do it. We kind of repaired the, the, you know, the the fault line in our relationship and uh, got back on the same page. And and so he was terrified. He set his alarm for two in the morning. Did he want you to come over at two in the morning? Well, he lived in New York City. I lived in Philadelphia. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, but ordinarily, I might actually consider, uh, you know, something like that. But it was, it wasn't yeah, practical. It wasn't uh, but uh, and then he came back the next week, and and he said he he, he just had to push himself because he did not want to do it. And then he he went down in his basement. He rolled himself up in the carpet. It was all pitch black, and he had the tape recorder going. He brought me the tape and played it. Wow! And uh, he was a hundred on the zero to hundred scale. You know, sheer panic. Oh yeah, and then, and then he started dictating his negative thoughts, and and he he said that he, he what he was afraid of, he thought a big fat ghost would come out of the darkness and sit on his chest and and suffocate him, and that was that was what he was afraid of. So he he was sitting there waiting for this ghost to come for fifteen minutes, and he was a hundred percent anxious the whole time, and finally you heard him say on the tape, he, he says, I'm tired of waiting for you. <laughs> you know, if you're going to sit on my chest, come on and do it now. I'm, I'm not going to wait any longer. Right. And then he said, no ghost appeared, and he just, you could hear him, he burst out laughing, laughing, and his anxiety went from 100 to zero, and he was cured, and his anxiety was gone, his depression was gone, and he was ready to, to terminate therapy. But it was a very specific intervention. But he also sounded like a very courageous person. Oh, yeah. Well, gosh, escape, escape from Nazi Germany, go go from shining and shoes so, on the sidewalk. To, I mean, he was willing to face that fear in the most yeah. in the scary. I can't imagine you creating a more scary situation for him. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But also, when you say to the patient, this is what I want you to do, what message does it give the patient? That you're strong enough to go through it. Then. Yeah, yeah, and that, that you're it strong enough to face your fears. Yeah, and you're not going to die. Nothing right. terrible, terrible is going to happen. But we could take a hundred patients, like we went on the Sunday hike today, and we saw people with a whole variety of different issues. We saw a beautiful man who who commuted to the hike all the way from Colorado, and sadly, he he's he's got a pretty severe form of cancer, and he's been having chemotherapy and. Uh, and it was a tremendous sadness. And he came. He he wanted to be with all of us on on a Sunday hike, and and and, and it was just so very very moving. Yeah. And and the way we worked with him then was unique, just to him. And then 
as you saw, we had others who had other kinds of problems re requiring specific interventions that target their negative thoughts and their ways of communicating that may may create problems for people. So that that's my only my I mean, only thing, thing is, about there's it. There's no doubt that Team CBT is extremely powerful and yeah and. Um, you know, and people reach enlightenment and get over their negative thoughts and feelings and have a beautiful life. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be its own. It doesn't have to be the only thing people do. People can do team CBT and then meditate and exercise. Yeah. And, you know, eat healthy yeah. and get enough sleep. Yeah. And have meaningful relationships Absolutely. with other people. And it all works together. Like oh, I think yeah. team CBT could be the foundation so that people could have, you know, a beautiful life. Yeah. And be able to accept love and, and cope with problems. Um, and these other things facilitate that as well. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think of that? Absolutely. I was wondering if you are going to ask me about my friend, friend I, Rob know, Christ. I'm ready to ask you that. You know, the other feedback I got from the previous podcast on mindfulness was that you started the podcast talking about your friend who died while meditating. Yeah. And the feedback... I got was that it was like so unbelievable. No one could tell if you were telling the truth or if you were joking. Well, telling or, the truth, as I was saying, I was kind of frustrated I, and disappointed that you guys didn't ask me about my friend well, and oh, how he happened to die. Yeah, meditating. it was unbelievable. I couldn't actually believe you were saying it. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I didn't ask you. I thought, oh, David must be joking. That cannot possibly be no, true. No, I wasn't joking. It was one of my best friends. So what happened? Well, he his name was Rob Christ, and uh, he was a little older. This was the late 60s in the Bay Area, the kind of the hippie era, and everyone was doing crazy things to kind of achieve enlightenment in those days, too. You know, yeah. there was LSD going around, and there were these psychodrama marathons. And he was a psychodrama director, but he had also started something called the Mid-Peninsula Free University, which was really cool. It was uh, in Palo Alto, and anyone could teach and anyone could be a student, and there were no grades and no credits. Hmm. So if you wanted to have a teach a class in nude poetry reading, oh. you'd, you'd announce <laughs> it in this bulletin that came out, you know, three uh -huh. times a year. Right. And then people would show up at your house at Tuesday evening at <laughs> 6 o'clock for nude poetry reading or whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever wild, weird thing you wanted to do. And it was a fantastic, it was magic was in the air in, wow. the, in the late. I mean, that's kind of, I know you're not teaching nude poetry anymore. It's kind of what you do when you teach the, t yeah. the Tuesday class for free. Anyone could come yeah. and get the benefits of learning. Well, it was inspired by that because Rob used to have one in a bar. Wow. Uh, that, that he would do a live uh, psychodrama in a bar uh, one evening in, in, in Palo Alto. They had a stage there. I mean, it wasn't drinking or something, but uh -huh. he would actually kind of do an, uh, an encounter with somebody. They'd have 30 or 40 people watching, and, wow. and people love that kind of thing. And that's why I do the live demos in the Tuesday group, because it is magical. Yeah. And, that's, and I learned yes, a, that a lot in those areas. But at any rate, one of the sad things about uh, Rob, and, you know, he, he was a— a beautiful, gentle person, but kind of wild. And and so he, he went into this form of meditation called Kundalini Yoga, if I remember it correctly. And it's, it's, it's like supposed to be one of the most extreme forms of meditation. And, and I don't want anyone listening to the podcast to, to try this. Uh, what, what's so funny? <laughs> Just can't wait to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not funny. My no, best friend not, died. No, it's not uh, funny. <laughs> so we shouldn't be laughing about it. But what he would do, he would uh, uh, sit in a ba the bathtub with just real hot water to where his head was just barely above the water until his t body temperature went up to 102 or 104 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then he had a second bathtub out in his yard filled with ice water, and he'd go and immerse himself in that. Right. And stay in there with his head barely above water. Yeah. And he said it gave him like out of body experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, he said he had a lot of even Stanford professors would come and, and do this. Yep. And, and, and he told me that, that, uh, and, and it's really pretty sad that, that when he would do this, like he his he, he would leave his body, and he would you know see this this light, and it, he would be tempted not to return to his body. That that gives me chills. Uh, yeah, and that uh, that there was a part of him that wanted to go all the way. 
and into the light. And he used to tell me, maybe, you know, one day I'll, I'll go... Go to the light. Go all the way in, in, into the light. And it was so sad. And then he was kind of an extremist, and he, he wanted to make it even more intense. Uh, so he, he, he got uh, laughing gas. Oh, that and, dentists use. And so when he would go into the, the ice water version, he would uh, inhale laughing gas. Nitrous oxide? Yeah, something like that, uh, to intensify the experience. And then uh, after I moved, we moved back to uh, Penn for my residency. When we left Stanford, then I got a call from someone that he, he had died doing that and okay but and that's so, not meditating that's going I'm, back I'm not, you're taking my comments as a criticism of meditation i was never oh. intending and I, nor do i intend now i'm just, just telling yeah. a sad story that of is your, a really sad of, story of a dear friend and yes it was it was it was interesting and uh no, I never was even critical of, of him or anyone would meditate or do anything to to achieve enlightenment or or inner or inner peace at all. Um, but I, I loved him, and he it was a great a great loss. Yeah, it sounds like a great loss um, to lose one of your best friends in a way that didn't have to happen. Yeah, you no, know, that was by his the choices that he made at that time, which. You know, he, he was doing for his own personal reasons to reach the light, and they had a really serious negative consequence of his dying. Now, that sounds even so stupid for me to say. Yeah. But anyway, that's all I was referring to. Um, Do you want to read the second email? Sure. I'll read the second one here. was uh, from a fellow named Paul, who I, I don't know. Hey, Dr. Burns. Uh, I am with you in terms of the skepticism of mindfulness as a panacea. I, am, uh, I also am not sure how particularly effective it is, uh, even, even as a tool in the fight against negative thoughts. I personally cannot seem to get anything out of it, but I'm trying to make sense out of how so many people can find it useful. And by the way, I, I resonated with what Paul just said. Uh, Perhaps, Paul continues, you could put it like this. Mindfulness is not a specific technique for specific problems. Hooray, 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 I would say. But a general method for psychological health, as uh, our friend Dr. Rhonda has been uh, claiming. <laughs> yes. If you have a specific medical condition, you'll get, want to get a specific treatment. Absolutely, right. Paul. And sometimes specific conditions can be alleviated by taking care of your health generally, uh, eating healthier, uh, sleeping better, and so forth. Still, depending upon the disease, in order to get rid of it, you'll need a specific treatment. However, even when you're not dealing with a specific disease, generally good health practices can lower your chance of getting any diseases and lessen the severity when they do arise. In some, perhaps the goal of mindfulness and CBT are different, or Team CBT are different. And that, you're absolutely right here, Paul. I think that might respect what both you and Fabrice and Rhonda <laughs> are, are getting at. I think this goes to answer the question I've had about team. To what extent is alleviation of anxiety and depression the final goal? Are there religious, spiritual, or psychological problems that are positive goals beyond relief? In feeling good, it sounded like you thought that happiness was just the absence of depression. Is that, that all there is to say about human flourishing? Or do you methodologically stick within the parameters of your client's value system, asking only, what can I help you with because you're a psychologist? Actually, I'm not a psychologist. And you're not a priest, for example, and Paul. And I loved the, the last thing. I loved, again, everything that both of these emailers wrote. And actually, when I'm working with people, it is more than just the absence of depression or anxiety, as you know, Rhonda. The, in, in a good session, there, there's a kind of a euphoria that, that develops, and often what you would call enlightenment. Exactly. And there's four different enlightenments that, that patients can experience. The enlightenment in, in recovery from depression is completely different from the enlightenment in recovery from an anxiety disorder. Then there's a third kind of enlightenment 
in recovery from a conflicted relationship, turning it into a loving one. And there's a fourth enlightenment in overcoming uh, ha habits and, and addictions. And I'm trying to include that spiritual, philosophical uh, dimension in, in, in my new book, Feeling Great. I'm having some trouble with it. Uh, the, the chapters uh, I've written are are helpful to people. This is at the end of the book, you know, going from the, the the cognitive dimension and the motivational resistance dimension to the to the spiritual dimension, uh, which, which is really what it's all about and what we're trying to do when we work with with people to get that that spiritual enlightenment. But part of it uh, is is that. You see, for, first of all, I'm, I'm trying to explain to the reader, a person could never criticize yourself. They can only criticize the specific things you say and do. Right, your behavior, your actions are your, the words that come out of your mouth. Yeah, uh, your thoughts, your beliefs, your actions. Uh, but all the pain comes when you generalize from your specific actions to, to yourself. Did you see? So, for example, you, you have some criticisms about the podcast, or other people have some criticisms about the podcast. That, that's never going to upset me because that's just kind of great thinking, great ideas we can dialogue about. And David is often wrong about things. So, why not? Here's some more stuff I can be <laughs> wrong about. And, me too. And yep. then we'll, we'll have fun hanging out, <laughs> yeah. learning from each other. <laughs> right. But when you generalize to yourself, thinking somehow yourself isn't good enough, that's where all the pain is. People can get that w with some help. Yes. But then the last point in the Enlightenment is, is once you figure out that people can't judge yourself, is then to give up the belief that you even have a self. That's the yeah. difficult part. That's the death of the self. And there are four deaths of the self. In recovery from depression, that's one death of the self. Recovery from anxiety is a second a great death of the self. Recovery from relationship problems is a third, and that's, to me, the most awful great death. It's very humbling. Yeah, and then the getting over your addiction to food or alcohol or porn or having affairs or whatever it is, that's a fourth great death, the, the, the death of the needy, demanding, pleasure-seeking, uh, entitled self. But what people can't get, and I, I might have to rewrite the last chapters of the book. See, there's a chapter in the books called How to Join the Grateful Dead. Yeah. <laughs> how to, how so to, many of them. Yeah. What so many of us want to do. <laughs> yeah. How to, how to get rid of the idea that you have a self, mm. uh, but people can't get it. And, and when I explain it really clearly, then they say, this is too philosophical. And then when I allude to, to it, then they get annoyed because they, they don't know what I'm talking about. So I might have to take that part out of would you think it would be book. interesting to have somebody on the podcast who's a, who's a spiritual teacher, like somebody from Spirit Rock, or a, who knows what we're talking about on the, a diff, or what you're talking about on a different level? Conceivably, uh, of course. That cynical Dave says those <laughs> people are all a bunch of con artists, and I kind of well, don't like con artists. I don't. I think we might be able to find one that isn't a con artist. Well, cool. Maybe we can have one on a, on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I, I've I quoted one, uh, and oh. I, I can quote for you. Okay, I'd just, love to just, hear that. Just close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you are one. <laughs> we are one with the universe. <laughs> You're enlightened now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we are one with the universe. <laughs> the, uh, there, there's something fantastic on YouTube everyone can watch. If you want to learn more about shame attacking exercises, <laughs> there's this fellow in England uh, called uh, jo Dom, Dom Jolly or Don Jolly or something like that. <laughs> that sounds like a porn star. Uh, no, no, he's not. <laughs> he's not at all. Uh, he, he's this fellow who uh, I think he he's the greatest comic in human history. <laughs> he, he's, he's like he's a, huh. a, an Einstein of, of comedy. Of comedy? And he had a show for two years. It was a hit in London. And then they brought it to the U.S. and it was a dud in the U.S. It was so crappy, the U.S. version, because they didn't understand British humor. It didn't work here. But you can find <clears throat> the season one and season two uh, for the British version of what was called Trigger Happy TV. And uh, he goes around London essentially doing bizarre things, shame attacking exercises, making a fool of himself. 
<laughs> they're so funny. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just incredible. Like then this one of them, he's he's uh, this, uh, teaching a, a mindfulness meditation oh, okay. class. Okay, I was wondering how it's getting back to mindfulness. <laughs> yeah, I know it does. <laughs> and he's like in the Y there, right. and he has all these people seated, you know, in a lotus position, and and he's saying one, <laughs> Om, you're <laughs> peaceful, you're at one with the universe, you know, this this kind of stuff. And then there, you hear a little commotion and in the hallway outside. So he says, I, I must leave for just a moment. I will I will return. <laughs> and then, then he goes out in the hall. He starts screaming at these people. He says, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say, I'm sorry for saying that word. <laughs> shut, 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 shut the F up. I'm, do, I'm doing a God a damn meditation class in, in there. <laughs> and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. And then he goes back in and sits down and says, um, peace. <laughs> we are all one with the universe. Yes, yes. So, he, he did not learn the antidote to anger. Yeah. So, anyway, any other thoughts uh, on well, our follow Well, one other thing that you're saying about, um, it reminds me of that <clears throat> once one re, you know, reaches euphoria, you're also teaching your patients how to reach that state on their own. I mean, they're not in therapy forever. That, and that's, that's right. one of the key points yeah. of your... And right. so you're teaching them... Or, a team CBT therapist is teaching their client or patient how to reach that state on their own. Yeah. And one of the things you've said before many times that really struck me is that nobody's really ent entitled to be happy seven days out of the week. Yeah, right. 24 hours a day. That's right. Can you say something about that? Yeah, we're all unhappy. To, I think everyone is uh, entitled to five happy days per week and two miserable days. And if you don't have your five happy days, you need to tune up. And if you're not having your two miserable days, then we're going to have to put you on lithium because you're getting too happy. And I think that's part of relapse prevention training is to know it's just natural for all of us to to drift in and out of of enlightenment. And uh, But I would want to say one closing thing here is for, there are certain kinds of negative thoughts for, for, for which what's taught in meditation could, could be helpful. Uh, I think for most negative thoughts, it's not going to be at all helpful. Uh, but but the, if somebody has, uh, let's say, obsessive-compulsive disorder, uh, like a, I had a, uh, a, uh, a man who, who was an eye doctor. He was a single man, lived with his mother, and he had obsessive compulsive disorder and, and uh, OCD, you get an obsessive thought that frightens you, and then you do a ritual. Correct. And so um, his obsessive thought was when, when he'd be giving people eye examinations, he'd see a floater. You know what a floater is? Yes. It's like you see this little thing, and it like a little dot in your vision, and it's normal, and it doesn't mean anything. But in one case in 10,000, and someone with... Severe diabetes, it can mean retinal detachment. Mm -hmm. And then you need laser surgery to, to fix up your retina. Well, he didn't have diabetes, uh, and, and there was nothing wrong with his retina. But every time he'd see one of those, he'd say, I might be going blind. Oh. And then that was his obsession. He'd go 100% anxious, and then he would give himself an eye examination. So between patients, he would give himself an eye exam. So every day at the office, he'd be giving himself six or eight eye examinations because he, he'd, he'd only be reassured for a few minutes. Well, that sounds exhausting and time-consuming. Yes, and then on weekends, he would go home and, and binge all weekend. He'd, he'd come into his office and just give himself like 40 eye exams a day. Ooh. It's all he did because wow. every time he'd have this anxious thought... Then he'd get panicky, and then he'd do the compulsion of checking his eyes. Now, the technique, we got, I have over 100 techniques that I use, but the technique uh, that w was helpful to him is very similar to mindfulness meditation. One of the things, one of the ways you meditate is you're, you try to focus on your breath, and then you notice a distracting thought, and then you, you okay, I have a distracting thought, and I'm going to bring it back to my breathing in a gentle way. And that's what an awful lot of meditation is. It's just that. And if you want to meditate, you, you know how now. 
<laughs> There's nothing else to it except BS you can add to it. <laughs> Mystical BS. But at any that's rate, so that, that's not a bad thing for that kind of thought. And so uh, we do teach that. And we've had this as a part of CBT and team, you know, ever since the mid-70s at least. And it's called uh, self-monitoring and reattribution. You you notice when you're having this recurrent thought, because he knows it's not a true thought, so we don't have to write it down on a mood log and find the distortions in it. He's, he's done that already, and logically he knows that's not true, that he's going blind. So I told him instead to count the thoughts and then bring his consciousness back to whatever he's doing, and, and that he's not allowed to do this compulsive ritual of giving himself an eye examination uh, and that I told him to count these negative thoughts for four weeks because often they go down in the third week. There's a, a, a time lag in, in it. So he's doing exactly what meditation is, except it has the added thing that he's not allowed to do the thing that'll give him relief. So there's a kind of an exposure piece to the intervention as, as well. And for the first Three weeks, he had, or first two weeks, he would have about 90 of these thoughts a day. And wow. he would count them on a golf counter that he wore on his wrist and then put them on a calendar and see, see how they change over time. And so they were like 80 to 100 every day for the first two weeks. And then in the, th in the third week, they went down to like 58 one day and then 33 the next day and 17 the next day and six the next day and two the next day and then zero. And he was cured of OCD. And that's exactly the type of thing that you would be doing in mindfulness meditation. And I used to call this m mindfulness in daily living. I've been saying that for thir 30 years. Yep. And it's just one technique. It happens to be the least effective of all of the 100 techniques that I use. And so, I but yet it worked for him. It worked for him, and and it's worked for two or three other patients as well. So there is something to be said for when when you're having a recurrent negative thought that you've already crushed using other techniques. That there can be something to be said for okay, you tell yourself, oh, there's that negative thought again. That's the reattribution. So you you reinterpret it. It's not that I'm going blind. It's just that I I have that OCD thought again. So you're naming it. Yeah. Oh, it's the OCD thought. Yeah. And then you can let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's I, I'm not going blind. I'm having my OCD thought. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I'm putting it on in a balloon and I'm letting it float away. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Or it could be the thought maybe uh, I've had patients at night. They keep thinking they left the stove on. So they get up and they check the stove and someone might do it, you know, 10 times. And then we had the woman in the Tuesday group who has the thought, oh, my hands are getting contaminated. And I've got to go wash them. And so instead you can say, oh, there's my that thought about contamination. And and then just let it go. Don't give in to the ritual of washing your hands. Don't give in to the ritual of checking the stove over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then focus on what you were doing. And in the context of OCD, you should also know that OCD is an addiction. And so the, the checking is the thing that gives you relief. So you get addicted to checking. Oh, how interesting. I've never thought of it that way. And then when you t tell the person response prevention is you're not allowed, if you want me to treat you, you have to give up that, that ritual of checking the stove over and over again, washing your hands over and over ag again, giving yourself an eye check o over and over again. And yes, your anxiety will increase for a couple of days, just like an addict. And then it will begin to decrease after that. So that, that response prevention can be a part of that. As well, so there is a uh, a therapeutic piece, as as Fabrice was saying, in meditation. The, we called it flexing the mindfulness muscle, the becoming strong in in letting go of certain dis distracting thoughts, rather than focusing on them and thinking they're, you know, something terribly important. That's a beautiful sentence. Becoming strong and letting go. Oh yeah, that's another paradox, and maybe with that we could. Uh, Call it a day. Is there anything else on? I think we're good on the subject. <laughs> do we do good? I I will wait to hear what the listeners have to yeah, say. Yeah, so make sure you you let us know because uh, we take your email seriously and appreciate the the thoughtfulness that uh, Jeremy provided. I thought his 
his note was mind blowing. And then Paul, I thought your note was mind blowing as well. Very thoughtful. Very nice that they they took the time and the effort to actually so it's like they spent all it um, put some effort into writing this and sending it off. So that's appreciated. Yeah. So I'm going to... Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, wait, uh, before we go, a brief commercial message, and I had this printed out here, that there's a bunch of cool workshops coming up. Did, did I send that to you? Or Oh, here we go. Thank you. Yes, and so we don't have commercials here on the podcast, but I, I, I do survive through, through my workshops and stuff, and... Uh, and are, uh, I'm having one on May 19th, a step-by-step treatment of anxiety disorder, step-by-step training for, for therapists. And Jill Levitt, a brilliant, wonderful person, uh, is going to be my co-teacher. Uh, and the, uh, it's almost sold out in person now. It's May 19th, and you can attend in person in Palo Alto or you can attend online, and we'll have, again, my Christian son and tons of fabulous people to help help you if you're online with the small group exercises. But we just had a fabulous one on habits and addictions about a month ago. It was really powerful. Yeah. And, um, and the online experience is wonderful, because you still break up into small groups and work with people. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so if, if you like, you can uh, check this out on my website, feelinggood.com on the workshop tab, and then you can check, the, click the, the link to, to yeah, learn all, to all about up. it, the details. And then there's going to be... Talk about the best things that you do, which is the four-day intensive. Yeah, and, and there are going to be two this summer in July, uh, one July 15th to 18th in Calgary, the four-day intensive, sponsored by Jack Hirose, who does a fabulous workshop. So again, there's a link for, for, for that one, the July 15 to 18 intensive. And also, starting July 29th to August 1st will be the four-day intensive at the South San Francisco Conference Center. And that one is, is usually the best of the year because we have people like Rhonda there and and Heather and uh, Brandon, and Brandon and Jill and Angela and, and all of these awesome people there uh, from the Feel- Feeling Good Institute from our Tuesday training group will be helping you with the small group exercises. So that's and a mind blowing. And experience. then Jill and I are going to do a live demo on day one with an audience volunteer. That's generally the highlight. And then you'll have a chance to work on your own personal issues as well. So hope to see you at one of the upcoming workshops. And with that, see you later. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.